this forum was the idea of Carmen Lee, who is a Hadley resident, and she's the founder of Stamp Out Stigma. She's also a survivor with a very powerful story about living with depression. And I just want to thank you, especially Carmen, for thank you making you know really nudging this into action. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I just want to provide a few words of context. Um, I felt really motivated by Carmen's idea because even though I am not a trained social worker and I am not a clinician, working with older adults for the past several years and doing home visits and um, being the director here at the Hadley Senior Center for the last three years has you know, exposed me to a lot of um, different aspects of life and things that can be difficult with aging and shown me some indicators about things that don't tend to work well as we age, as well as things that work wonderfully as we age. And um, this senior center is a testament to something that really does work, socialization, coming together, fellowship, friendship, um, staying connected with your community. Those are the ingredients to being happy. Um, so I just want to say that there's a lot of positives with aging. Um, it's, it's certainly not it doesn't need to be a tragedy. Um, but there have been tough things that um, I've witnessed, and I'm sure every one of the people at this table have witnessed that you are have witnessed, I'm sure, and um, concern for neighbors, maybe concern for yourself. And I'm hoping that you're brave enough to ask some questions and brave enough to think about ways to seek help if you believe that that's something that you could use to make your feeling of well-being more robust. Um, so I'm just going to quickly introduce our panelists in the order in which they will speak. Um, Emma Riley here is a, the co-response supervisor for clinical support options. You'll probably hear the acronym thrown around today, CSO, CSO. That's the major behavioral health agency in our region, and Emma is a key worker there. She's been the co-responder for the communities of Hadley and East Hampton with their police departments for at least a year, maybe. Um, is that about right? Yeah. And we are so grateful to have her. Um, I'm just aware that she makes many calls to various crisis scenarios, um, all the better for her wisdom, expertise, and non-threatening approach to helping people who are experiencing some kind of distress with a mental health situation. Um, Liz Pluff is the new community social worker in East Hampton. How long have you been working there? That's really recent. It is recent. I started in July. Hmm. July, okay. A couple months. Yeah. Um, and formerly, she was a medical social worker at Bay State Medical Center in Springfield. Um, so I know that she works closely with the Council on Aging in East Hampton. Carmen Lee, who I've already referred to, is the founder of Stamping Out Stigma. Um, a speaker's bureau, bureau that she founded in California. Um, and she is a survivor and a powerful witness regarding living with depression. And i um, really grateful to have her here. Seth Dunn is Director of Program Development at ServiceNet. And he teaches courses in the schools of social work at Smith College and Westfield State University. Jen Matomi works with the Pioneer Valley Coalition for Suicide Prevention and I have met her previously. She's attended a health fair here and given um, really great information. And she also does presentations, and she has done a presentation on suicide prevention here at the Senior Center. Grateful to have her as well. Cassie Kramer is, um, works for the Massachusetts Association for Mental Health, and she is the project director for the Older Adult Behavioral Health Network, which you might be really glad to know exists. And um, she's also a proponent of elder mental health outreach teams, which is a model of a team approach to helping people in their homes in various ways. Um, and lots of the aging services access point organizations in the state um, have launched these teams. And um, so Jen knows a lot, and so Cassie knows a lot about those. Um, so now I'll just introduce, so Emma, take it away. Hi, ooh, that is very loud. <laughs> we moved that down a little bit. Hi, everybody. I think I've met some of you guys before.
Moore. I'm Emma Riley. I'm a co-response clinician in Hadley and East Hampton. Um, so I split my time between the two towns. I am an employee of Clinical and Support Options, as Haley had said, CSO system. All right, how's that? Okay, there's a lot of feedback. Um, so I work with the police officers. We have an officer and the back officer, Ryan. Um, what I do primarily is twofold. So one thing that I do is when crisis calls come in to Hadley or East Hampton, I respond with the officers. Sometimes it's mental health, sometimes it's mental health adjacent. So we have car accidents, which right, can be very stressful. That is not necessarily a mental health crisis, but there can be some mental health need there. And so I go and I try to provide support. Um, the other thing I do that is probably relevant to why we're here right now is follow-ups. So a lot of times the officers will go on a call, maybe they'll go to a well-being check, and they'll notice that somebody maybe is a little bit off or is expressing some kind of distress, but they don't need an immediate crisis response. They'll let me know and I'll follow up the next day or within the next couple of days and try to provide some additional support. So that is, in a nutshell, what I do. So this was a new role for East Hampton. It's actually a very new role for Western Massachusetts. Um, community municipal social workers are very well known in the Eastern part of the state. Western Mass is slowly getting on board. So um, I work with the health department, but my primary role is really to be a resource for the community. So um, I can take referrals for individuals and families of all ages. Um, I work very closely with our senior population. Um, I work closely with the Council on Aging. Um, actually, Emma and I just did a nice group pizza party a couple weeks ago, which was really great to meet some more folks over there. Um, shortly after I started, I had a fair amount of interest from seniors in our community for a grief and bereavement support group. Um, a lot of people had expressed that especially following the pandemic, they were really faced with some significant loss um, and just needing to connect. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is very official. Um, so I recently started a grief and bereavement focused support group at the Senior Center. We meet once a month um, and I think that has been a really nice opportunity to meet with some of the older adults in the community. Um, I also do home visits, I would say, almost every day at this point. So I go out, um, I talk with seniors in their homes about what they need, what their challenges are. Um, we have found that we actually have a lot of seniors in East Hampton who live by themselves, and maybe they have a little bit of help, but they don't have a lot of people checking in daily. So I try to make sure that um, everybody at least feels like they have some support um, I think, especially coming out of the pandemic, we had a lot of people who maybe felt like they didn't have as much support or checking in as they would have liked. So we're really trying to make sure that anybody who um, is in need or might just benefit from seeing somebody more often than they currently are, that we're taking care of that. Um, and in addition to that, just in terms of resources, um, especially this time of year with the colder weather comes the increased need for financial support. Um, everybody's expenses seem to go up this time of year, so I try to be as available as it can be to the community to um, tackle any financial related concerns for seniors. So that is the summary of what I do. You're up, I guess. Sure. Okay. Uh, Haley, I can't talk in just five minutes. Do your thing. Hi, Carmen Lee, and I moved here three years ago in May to be with my daughter who retired from Mount Holyoke. Uh, teaching, and I'm from San Francisco, and uh, I um, have been hospitalized over 20 years collectively since I've been 24, and I've been out of the hospital now since about 47, and uh, have been pretty well. I still have to be very careful of stressors. 
Um, and I'm a very busy person, but I have to be careful of scheduling or over scheduling. Um, I started out um, thinking everybody was pretending. I thought even in the fifth grade, fifth, uh, five years old, I thought everybody in the first grade was pretending to be happy. So that was the premise. I thought everybody was staging. And uh, we all have to stage sometimes. You have a headache and you, if someone says, how are you today? And you say, oh, fine. So we do, that's part of our culture, to, to say things uh, more positive. So I started out and I went to college, which was a great uh, struggle because of concentration. You're concentrating on something inside that's despair or and then I became an airline stewardess. In those days, that was very tough to become an airline stewardess, and flew around always with this pain inside. But I didn't. I couldn't identify with it. And then I um, um, had married Mr. Wright and had baby Wright, doing everything according to the American dream. And uh, when Tina was about a year and a half, I just stopped talking and went into catatonia. Do you all know what catatonia? And uh, I was in a hospital for eight months where I lived, and then two years in the hospital in Maryland. And then in and out shock treatments, and I've seen them work, but it didn't help me, but I have seen them work. And then in 1967, they wanted to perform a lobotomy. So, and my husband would not stand in the papers. So I've been there, and um, it's been wonderful to see people addressing stigma, because that's the great, greatest deterrent for housing, for relationships, for services, stigma is paramount in trying to reduce. And uh, people have to understand. Um, I finally met a doctor who saw me free for 35 years, and I reached a level of feeling very confident, and I started a speaker's bureau. I was tired of people thinking that mentally ill people had knives in their pockets and guns in their purses, and they did all these horrible things, so we started a speaker's bureau, composed of people basically like myself who didn't wear another sleeves. And I didn't know if it was going to take off, but it's short. And we had 2,600 presentations in 27 years. And it's spread all through the country now. The university, there's 400 universities in the United States now that have an organization called Active Minds. And they adopted it after the SOS program. The SOS um, has an office in Washington, D.C., believe it or not, but it's not uh, nothing to do with me. It's Beacon Health has adopted it. So, so many people around the country have adopted this, and it warms my heart to take something that's been so painful and turn it around into a, a positive force for change. And I'm so thankful you guys are all here and that Haley uh, did this for all of us. So, um, more later, I hope. So should I use this or this? What that's working handle. <laughs> this this is working. Right. I'll go for this. Yeah. Anyway. Hello everybody. I'm Seth John and I am an MSW clinical social worker and have been for since 1977 when I got my diploma, my, my MSW. Um, my whole career has been focused on community mental health. Um, mostly in the realm of working with children and families, but that is also inclusive of adults from really all ages and stages, you know, from little kids right through people well into their, I've had clients as old as almost 90. And um, my role at ServiceNet has been very, quite varied. I've been at the agency uh, for 22 years and I originally came on to be a uh, director of the outpatient child and family clinic and have stayed active clinically, even though I have other roles, I've been basically a program developer. What's that? I write grants and try to develop programs and bring more programming to the community uh, to benefit everybody, sometimes specialized populations, other times more just for everyone. And um, part of what I do is research where needs are and seek funding to meet those needs. Um, as we, as we know, we're an aging population, and we are actively trying to find ways to provide more specialized services that meet the needs of 
folks who are over 50. Uh, I have some clinical experience in this area, and I like to just kind of build off of what you were saying tonight. And I want to thank you for your for your very heartfelt words. I think that really speaks volumes to the fact that lots of people have mental health challenges. In fact, I try to reframe them as really sensitive people who are more highly attuned to stressors in life. And they express it and we diagnose it in these kind of medicalized terms, but it's part of living. All of us feel anxious and depressed. Well, that's the way the world is. It's, life is hard sometimes. And we should phrase, frame therapy perhaps more as a conversation between a person who's trained to listen, to offer advice, to be supportive, and an individual person who has things that are important to say. And that's why I like to try to frame the work that we do. It's a, it's a conversation. Yeah, we have to use diagnosis and whatnot and build for it. But that's the way our country is structured. At the bottom, of, at the end of the day, people should feel that find somebody who you can really talk to, who will listen, who you can be yourself with. And then together, put our heads together, we find solutions or we just get support. We get support from each other. And that's, so I think it's, in terms of the topic of stigma, let's try to move beyond that. We are human beings and we have needs, emotional needs, that, that we have sometimes need a little help with. And I'll leave it at that. I love that, thank you. So I'm Jen Matomi, and Haley's going to grab a couple of my photos um, that are going to show on the big screen. So again, I am co-chair of the Pioneer Valley Coalition for Suicide Prevention. I'm also a suicide prevention trainer, and I run a support group for people who've lost someone to suicide. And I also worked on the crisis counseling program during the pandemic. It was a FEMA-funded grant that we had here in Massachusetts for 18 months. Um, and it was very challenging to reach people, um, especially the senior population during that time. Um, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about Pioneer Valley Coalition for Suicide Prevention, um, which Carmen is a part of. And Carmen, thank you for sharing your story. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of my story as well today because that is something that we feel is very important to help evoke change and to help save lives from suicide. Um, so this is our group putting together some care packages for suicide attempt survivors and suicide loss survivors. We have two different packages. So we do community events like that and um, to bring people together, you know, we do education around suicide prevention. We table out in the community, bring lots of resources. We do advocacy work um, both locally. We, we've worked for years trying to get some uh, bridge barriers put up, suicide prevention barriers put up on a local bridge. We go to the state house every year um, to advocate for mental health funding and suicide prevention funding and legislation. Um, we also work in conjunction with a bunch of local agencies, you know, people in our coalition, they're both, we have professionals and then we also just have people who have been affected by suicide. Um, we do work closely with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, the Massachusetts chapter. And um, for example, we are having an event um, Saturday to, for suicide loss survivors. It is International Suicide Loss Survivor Day on Saturday, so we're having a mini healing conference for that. Um, and the reason I got into this work, if we can advance to my next picture here, is because I lost my mom to suicide. And that was um, the hardest experience of my life. Um, I'm just looking for my picture. <laughs> um, my mom was 58. And you know, there's no single cause when someone dies by suicide. It's always a multifactorial event. Um, but some things that were going on in my mom's life at the time was that she was pretty much forced to retire um, early, which she was not happy about. Um, she had had her career for 30 years or so, and she was experiencing some physical illness, some mental illness with some depression, and also had family commitments taking care of her aging parents. And her job wanted her to work full time. 
and um, she just wasn't able to. So, you know, that was a big loss for her. And losses and changes and transitions, those are times when people can be at more at risk for suicide. Um, we did not see it coming in my family. Um, we thought that she had a lot of resources and support. We knew she had depression. Um, the retiring seemed to coincide a lot with the depression. Um, she became, you know, kind of isolated, wasn't hanging out with her friends as much, didn't have the energy. She told me that she felt ashamed about her depression, that people wouldn't understand it. Um, and so that was, you know, very hard. Um, I think there were times that she maybe felt like a burden, you know, and all of these things are risk factors and warning signs for suicide. Um, she withdrew from some of the activities that she used to do because she just wasn't feeling up to doing them. Um, my mom also had a history of trauma, which is a risk factor for suicide. Um, she did suffer some abuse as a child. It wasn't something that she talked about a lot, and she did receive therapy for it later in life. Um, but like something like that, another issue that we historically haven't often talked about in families is suicide. And so up here behind me, that's a picture of me sharing some family photos with my daughter, my young daughter, who never did get to meet my mom, her grandma. And it's been important to me to share with my daughter about my mom and who she was because I refuse to allow her life be defined by her death. Um, and so, you know, I explained to my daughter what happened to her in an age-appropriate way. I, you know, received some professional guidance on how to explain it to my daughter. And I, you know, kind of use it as a way to have conversations about mental health and to normalize mental health issues and how it's very important to talk about them. Um, and we have a program actually called Talk Saves Lives. And so when people talk about the, um, feelings and experiences that they're having, that is a way that you can reach out and get support when you need it. And then also it's important to talk to someone when you're concerned about them, when you've picked up on some warning signs. Um, it's so important to have those conversations. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, my mom had felt shame over her depression. You know, we really need to have, we need to treat our mental health like physical health. And, you know, we don't feel embarrassed when we've broken our arm, you know, so why should we feel shame over something that's going on mentally? We really shouldn't. And unfortunately, you know, there's been this stigma, but I do think that the more that we can talk about it and normalize it, um, the less stigma there will be. And I, I have been pleased to see things changing, especially after the pandemic. It does seem like mental health has really been brought out much more into the open. Um, but, you know, depression and thoughts of suicide, that is not a, I hesitate to use the word normal, part of aging. It's something that you do want to receive treatment for and support for if you are experiencing um, those things. And so um, I did also want to mention that older adults are one of the top two age groups that die by suicide the most and men die by suicide much more often than women. Suicide attempts by older adults are also more deadly than attempts by other populations. There's a variety of reasons for that. Um, so what do you do when you're worried about someone? Um, really, the best thing that you can do is to reach out and show support and show interest. You know, ask them, hey, what's what's been going on with you and listen to what they have to share, you know, very compassionately, show curiosity, don't be judgmental about what they're sharing, um, and just listen to their story wholeheartedly, talk to them privately, you know, you can tell them, hey, I'm concerned about you, this is what I've noticed, can we have a conversation? And um, if you want to talk with them about suicide, then it's really important to ask the question directly, are you thinking of ending your life? You know, some people think that if I ask someone about suicide, I'm going to plant the idea in their head, but that is a myth, and it's very important to ask the question directly. And then to help connect them to some help. And if you don't feel like you can help connect them, you could just connect them with someone else 
who can help them. Um, so I wanted to share a few resources with you. Um, there is 988 is the new suicide crisis lifeline. Um, it, just like we have 911 for emergencies, we now have 988 for mental health emergencies. And that was something that we um, advocated for for many, many years to um, get this new number in place that's much shorter and easier to remember. Um, also, 211, you can really call 211 and they will help you get connected to crisis services. Um, CSO provides crisis, mobile crisis services here in the area, so does BHN, uh, the Behavioral Health Network. So there's mobile crisis that will come to you, there's places where you can walk in, you can always go to the hospital, there's also respite programs and partial hospitalization programs where someone could stay for a short time if they need some care in that way. Um, there's the Brattleboro Retreat Center up in Brattleboro, um, which I know many people who stayed there and had a positive experience. There's also um, in Massachusetts the Behavioral Health Access Line, which helps people find counselor. Um, they will actually do the legwork for you to, to help get you a counselor. And it, and it can be challenging to get a counselor these days, especially, um, but they really do help to take some of the, the hard work out of it. Um, so that number is 888-502-2425. There's also locally the Wildflower Alliance that provides suicide prevention trainings and groups. They have a group called Alternatives to Suicide for people who are feeling suicidal and really need to talk about it amongst peers and people who understand. There's also NAMI, the National Alliance for Mental Illness, which provides support groups for people with mental health conditions. Um, and then as I mentioned, you know, there's the, our coalition. We're always out and about in the community and looking for more volunteers to get involved with the projects and things that we do, and also AFSP, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. So thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cassie Kramer. I'm a social worker and a peer specialist. Um, I've worked for the past 15 years at an aging service access point, um, some rural Cambridge Elder Services. <clears throat> I first was in protective services and then um, moved over to one of the state's first elder mental health outreach teams. Um, it was really my experience in protective services that led me to older adult behavioral health advocacy. I found that many people were chronically at risk because of the lack of accessible, um, ongoing mental health supports. Um, I really saw how this led to the development of preventable disability through things like mismanaged blood pressure, or diabetes, or for um, hospitalizations, or for early admissions to nursing homes and unwanted admissions to nursing homes. Um, I joined a group of grassroots advocates, the Mass Aging and Mental Health Coalition. Um, they've been meeting since 1999. Um, we're now the Older Adult Behavioral Health Coalition, um, with the goal of developing a statewide network of older adult behavioral health supports. Um, I guess our, one of our biggest advocacy areas in the past few years has been um, elder mental health outreach teams. Last year, we actually more than doubled the funding for those, um, and now I. I heard that success led to um, supports in this area, and I think that was also because of um, the local advocacy of the senior center. So I, I really think that advocacy happens both statewide, but then on, on local levels too, and that's really how change happens. Um, I can share more about NHOTS if people are interested, but it's, it's kind of a, a connection to services in the community. People provide short-term counseling, crisis intervention, um, family meetings, that type of uh, critical supports for people. Um, other of our priorities with the Older Adult Behavioral Health Network have been older adult peer supports, and we're so excited to have Carmen um, as a California transplant to Massachusetts um, as, as we really start to get those supports going. Um, we've also worked on getting very good treasures, um, peer support for decluttering trainings happening. Um, and we do public education. We have an event coming up um, December 8th with a geriatric psychiatrist, Dr. Pinals. That's a virtual event, which 
some senior centers, I think, are live streaming. Um, and we also have been partnering with organizations like Dignity Alliance and one of our uh, founding members um, of Dignity Alliance um, is here, Judy Fonch, and she's also an active member of our group. Um, Dignity Alliance is a, a wonderful organization that really came to be during the height of the pandemic. A lot of people actually came out of retirement because they were so horrified at what was happening in nursing home, so it was led by um, independent living centers, people with disabilities, and people in the aging network really um, coming together to really promote meaningful community alternatives and um, nursing home um, transformation. Um, let's see, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that, because um, yeah, it's a, it's a great group today. I'm sure you have lots of questions, and I'm anxious to hear what's um, in, on your minds. So I think we're going to open it up for questions. I'll pass a mic around because I do think it's extra helpful to be heard. And um, so hoping that some folks might be brave and open up questions to this group. If not, I'm going to. I have some. <laughs> we're going to ask you yeah. a question. You better ask. <laughs> going once, going twice. Judith, did you have a question? Or George? Uh, I guess uh, in my particular case, I'm thinking, I'm sorry, I'm thinking I need to refer some of my children to your <laughs> with, with all due respect. But, no, I, I found the presentation very interesting. Uh, to, I don't know anyone here, but there's a, uh, a Zoom group that is supported by the uh, United Healthcare that I have called Secure Senior Connections, and uh, it's it's kind of much like what you're talking about—a place for people to simply, in a Zoom setting, safe setting, of course, talk to one another, uh, mostly about positive things, but occasionally ne negative things. And I, I found that very helpful. But uh, I'm also fortunate to be here and still on this side of the grass. So. <laughs> could, I, could I mention something? Sure. Give us back. Green is on. Okay. You can see. Okay. Um, if I had had help as a child, a youngster, I would not have suffered all those years. Mm. So uh, saying your children could use it, I certainly could have used it when I was yeah. five or six. But that was the era where you had to be really going down the street with no clothes on or acting very bizarre in, in order to get help. But I, I just think it's so imperative. There's a movie star, Glenn Close, do you know? Yeah. Yeah. She started a group on 1997, Fashion After Art, but she deals with high schools. And she has clubs all around the United States of kids that have psychiatric problems. Hmm. So, um, hats off to her because maybe those kids won't have to grow up so um, impaired. So, you got to do it. Yeah, I'd like, to, <coughs> I'd like to just add a little bit to that. Uh, I guess this is sure yeah, thanks. Um, a lot of elders, grandparents, and they're many times taking care of their grandchildren or helping their kids take care of their grandchildren. Or their children are in that what we call sandwich generation. And they're trying to maintain their careers and their households and take care of their kids and also look after their parents and aunts and uncles. And I think you all have a very important role in the family. Um, there's a lot of wisdom, life experience, where I think you can convey in a non pathological way, like they're not crazy. Hey, everybody needs to talk to somebody. It helps to get advice. And you know, we should not feel like we have to put all these stressors and tensions in the closet and make believe they don't exist. Let's let's talk about it together as a family. If we need to get a professional involved, that can help too. So it's really opening up closed conversations and, and also not feeling ashamed. We live in stressful times. And I think destigmatizing it. And that's why I was saying 
you know, we're here at service that we do all patient mental health. But I'd like to reframe it and say what we really do is offer therapeutic conversations for people, individually, family sessions, and groups. And um, there shouldn't be anything to be ashamed about. Um, the last thing I want to say, which is similar, is that when you get to be older, you're always thinking about your life and the past and thinking about what's coming. And by being able to process that with somebody else, you can gain a, gain a sense of integrity about your life. Yeah, this worked out, this didn't work out. This is what I'm worried about. And you have to come to terms with things. So the very famous psychologist, Eric Erickson, talked about this being the stage of integrity versus despair. To avoid despair, we try to talk these things through and come to terms with them. Uh, it's very, very helpful. And I've personally seen many people who really benefited in, in their older years from talking about their lives and coming to terms with it. I have numerous clients that some of them in the past and some of them right now were, were coming to terms with some tough stuff. And they have to face, OK, I have to forgive myself for what I did 40 years ago. And I just accept that and ask for forgiveness to my children, et cetera. So, I'd just like to ask about your experiences with dementia as a behavioral health problem. Any of you? What was that? Now? Dementia. Dementia. Yeah. All right. From a sort of family perspective, to dealt with that. Um, from a family perspective and family counseling, I think it's a time for families to come together to say, how can we support our person who we love, whose cognitive abilities are beginning to decline? Okay, I don't even want to use a term. You know, we could say that they need more support. How do we do that? And rather than stigmatizing it, I always advise people to say, let's take a look at the ecosystem of our lives, what's in our community, and how can we provide, as a person needs, more supports. Part of what social workers do is go out and try and find supports and link people up. Uh, so it may not be that to go and person has to go into a nursing home. There may be day programs. More stimulation sometimes can forestall it. Um, and then there's also the difficult process of sometimes trying to convince somebody. Um, we use an approach called motivational interviewing, where we're not telling somebody what to do, but we're looking at the alternatives, and the pros and the cons, and we're trying to help people to come to terms with, okay, what's the best choice? And exploring people's ambivalence about it. I don't want to leave my home, or I feel like I'm okay, and kids are concerned, but it gets nowhere, so we try to broker conversations so that we can get to an outcome that people are okay with. Is it? I just wanted to ask Emma, as a follow-up, what experiences have you had trying to protect people with dementia? Sure, so we get a decent number of requests for psychiatric hospitalization for folks with dementia. That's a fairly common thing that we get both from families and from um, nursing homes sometimes. And we work really hard to try to get people into an appropriate level of care. Hospitalization, unless there's some underlying psychiatric condition, typically isn't the right course of action. So I don't have all the answers for it. I think some of what he was referring to is probably more appropriate. But um, we do try really, really hard not to get somebody into a, a situation like a hospitalization where they're going to be in a room with no windows for an extended period of time. That, Lack of stimulation is the exact opposite of what we were referring to. So we do work really hard at that. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. I could also add um, a, a lot of the aging service access points have um, uh, memory consults, which can be really helpful. Um, and I, they also have caregiver support programs, um, which I think also is often um, help in those situations, um, and I'm a big proponent of 
of course, peer support, kind of connecting with other family members that are going through that same thing and um, getting support that way. I don't think I'll walk over where you're Oh, yeah. Got my stuff, Sam. Thank you, Phil. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Phil Donahue. <laughs> uh, my name is Suzanne. Thank you. I, I appreciate all your presentations. I have a um, observation about our senior center and a suggested solution. Can you hear? Can you hear? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Carmen was giving me the ear. Okay. Um, you know what I this is this is a wonderful senior center. I'm sure you will all agree. It's 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 beautiful. It's it's modern. It's clean. People seem happy. There's lots of different places that you can just hang out if you're not in a group. Um, and I think we, we get a fair amount of people here. But what I have noticed is that it can become very clicky. So for instance, um, one time I went to go play some cribbage. There's a cribbage group that plays in. I went up there and they were all around their table and you know I come up into the room and they all turn and see, oh who's that? And then they turn back to do their cribbage. You know, and then I'm like, okay, so then take a deep breath, be a big girl, you know, stay around. So I'm staying around and I'm looking and I'm saying, oh, where, how, how are you guys playing? And, and how many games are there? Trying to get somebody to say, come on, you want to come play? You know, and instead I got we're playing with three per board, you know, and that. And, and I've seen, you know, there's, there's the pool players, there's the dancers, there's the card players. Um, and it's not any um, diss on, on this center because it's, it provides a lot of that. But what I realized is, you know, at 64 years old, it's really hard to go up to somebody that you don't know. You know, <clears throat> and say hello, introduce yourself, for me at least. And I think for most people, because a lot of people don't do it. You know, so I see one familiar face, I'm like, oh, George, George, come sit at my table. You know, so my, I think one thing that may increase people's uh, socialization with each other is name tags. So, name tags. Um, I go to uh, Sun City West every winter, which is a 55 and older community, and they have over 100 clubs. Anything you can think of, from woodworking to, to macrame to golf to whatever. Well, there's a lot of people to meet, and nobody ever remembers anybody's name, and especially if you see a face that's like familiar, but then you don't remember their name, you know, you're, you're horrified, and you don't go up to them. So what I would suggest, and I was just kind of looking on Amazon and stuff, is that that become, becomes an option here at the Senior Center that people can buy a name badge there. I mean, I don't really want to use those, those adhesive ones and waste paper and all that, but it's for 10 bucks you can buy something that says at the bottom, Council of Aging, at the top, Suzanne A, or Suzanne R. Napoleon. And I think you will find that people do much more willing to invite people in and say hello and such. That's it. No way. <laughs> I love it. That's a great idea. I won't charge for the idea. Okay. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Hi, I'm, I'm Nancy. Um, my question is, if I um, or someone I know wants to access your services, do they need a physician's referral? And who pays the bill? Blue Cross and Blue Shield, Health New England? Is there a charge for any of your services? I, mean, I, I can tell you that outpatient, quote, mental health, outpatient counseling for Anything from an adjustment distress that you're going through to a serious mental illness, substance abuse, the whole range. Anyone who has insurance in Massachusetts is eligible. Uh, if you're on Medicare, 
they take Medicare. Um, if you're not on Medicare, you've got Commonwealth Connector or Blue Cross plan, it's almost impossible for somebody in Massachusetts right now to not have a pay source for, for mental health or substance use counseling. It's pretty much universal. I don't know about other sources. I, oh, yeah. Well, I have a terrific therapist. I, she's in this room, actually. I'm not going to point it out because she blushes. So, <laughs> but it's through ServiceNet, and I don't pay anything. Of course, I have very, very low income, but I imagine at this stage in life, a lot of people are low income with the inflation, etc. But um, I've always managed, and somehow, and uh, I've always been on the low end of uh, the economic ladder, but it's out there, there is help. Yeah, some other resources people can check out. Um, Psychology Today has a great directory for finding therapists. Um, I found that with telehealth, it actually really expands kind of the um, amount of providers available there, and I've, I've been able to find some um, people, therapists that speak like languages um, that take math health, like otherwise would be very difficult um, to find. Um, and I also want, and you can also search by kind of modality, like, and there's a lot of different types of therapy. I actually, at one point, um, myself saw a therapist who was an expressive art therapist, and that was covered by my insurance, and um, it's something I, I really gained a lot from. I also wanted to follow up on the comment you had about um, the name tags and loneliness, and I recently our group joined AARP's um, actually a pretty pioneering campaign and loneliness mass look it up um, but they have a campaign to end social isolation and it's a it's a great organization highly recommend but um, yeah it was formed to because it really uh, understands that it's a huge problem um, in, in all communities and um, that it actually social isolation is on par with smoking for like risks um, health risks so yeah it's a great suggestion could I say something about telehealth I'm um, glad you mentioned that because a lot of times people will call and say, well, there's nobody available. I mean, there's a lot of therapists in the Pioneer Valley, but boy, everybody seems to be full. With telehealth, any licensed mental health clinician in the Commonwealth can see you. So I've heard of families who have a therapist in Cambridge and they go on telehealth or <laughs> lives on a cave. So I, I would say, expand the horizons. Um, I have a friend who practices in Boston. She's Japanese American. She speaks fluent Japanese. She's got clients all over who need a bilingual, bicultural therapist. So that's a wonderful resource. So don't forget the idea of telehealth. And you can also do family work with telehealth. I want to just tell you, I have a client who's older and daughter lives somewhere else, and we do family therapy, two separate locations on Zoom. And it really is helpful, especially with the pandemic and not wanting to have interactions with people face to face. So it really adds a lot to the creativity. This is a question, uh, I guess, probably for Jennifer. Um, is there a difference between men and women in the um, incidents of suicide. I, I ask this because I have an, a wonderful neighborhood and in the neighborhood there were two or three men who lost their wives and they were really lost. And, um, you know, a couple of neighbors were talking about the fact that one of these men was really, seemed so despondent and nobody knew quite what to do about it. Um, could you speak to that? Yes. Um, so, yes, as I mentioned earlier, men do die by suicide four times as often as women. And um, women do attempt suicide, though, more than men. Men you typically use more deadly means. And, um, yes, I mean, what I would suggest for when you see someone like who's struggling, again, is also just really to reach out to them and say, hey, you know, I'm concerned, or hey, I care about you, I wanna, you know, could we talk a little bit? How are you doing? You know, I'm so sorry about your loss. And just 
trying to reach out to them and let them know that help is available, help to connect them to some of the resources we mentioned, um, maybe to a therapist, maybe to a clergy member if that's sort of their thing, or their primary care doctor, could they start there? Um, just finding someone who could help connect them to some help. Does, does that answer your question? Yes. Um, I was thinking as you're talking that sometimes um, seems to me that men are reluctant, more reluctant, to admit that they need help. So they might listen but not do anything. You know, or they might talk but not do anything about it. Yes. Yes, um, I actually work with some people who've written a four-part book series on men's mental health, and it's stories of men who are sharing their recovery stories, you know, people who have been through divorce or substance use or suicide attempts and have, you know, come out the other side. And so we do feel like sharing stories is one way to help um, encourage people. And, but yes, you know, certainly we have um, some, there's some toxic masculinity in our society, and, and some men have been, um, you know, reluctant, as you said, to get help. In a situation like that, I would probably check back in with the person. You know, it's, sometimes it's not enough to just do it once. To, to really follow up with them is really important. And you can't make someone do something. That's not really your goal. Like you want to just be there for them and try to make it maybe easier or accessible for them because when someone is struggling, it can be hard to reach out for help. It can be hard to do that legwork to look for a therapist and to make all of those phone calls. Um, so yeah, I mean, reaching out multiple times can be important. Um, I can also say from my own personal experience, I did talk with my mother once about suicide. Um, we were very surprised when my mom took her life. And I had spoken with her in the year before she died. And I had mentioned a friend of a friend who had died by suicide and I brought it up to her. And I said, you know, have you thought about suicide before? And she said, yes, you know, in my deepest, darkest depression, I have thought about it but I would never do that to you guys. And something changed, you know, she died a year later and I thought, oh, okay, I've talked to my mom about this. She's okay, she told me she would never do it and you know, me being her child, I trusted her and she meant it at the time, I don't think she was lying, but things, you know, she really became hopeless at some point and things changed. And so I didn't realize that it would be something that I should check on more frequently and talk to her about regularly. And just like that conversation that I had with my daughter about how my mom passed away and my mom's mental health and how we have this in our family, some mental health struggles, um, and that it's important to talk about all of that stuff, the professional who helped guide me to have that conversation with my young daughter said, you know, this is going to be one conversation of many that you will have with her about this and let her know that she can always bring up her grandma and talk to you about it or, you know, bring up her own mental health struggles. And so my husband and I are always just checking in with her and encouraging her to name her feelings and share her feelings and all of those things. Oh, I have one other thing to say about um, when you're talking about telehealth. Uh, I have been surprised that even certain therapies can be done via telehealth, like we were talking about trauma earlier, and what I have found as a very effective um, type of treatment for trauma specifically is a therapy called EMDR. And I have met therapists who are able to do that even via telehealth with their clients. Um, and I've met many, many people, um, especially suicide loss survivors, who have really felt that that particular therapy helps them quite a bit. And what is that? 
EMDR, okay, so <laughs> if it's eye movement rapid desensitization, <laughs> that's what it stands for. Um, the military, I know, has been using it, and it's been used for many, many years, and has proven to be effective. And the way I would describe it, your both sides of your brain are being stimulated. You can hold these um, sensors that vibrate in your hands. That's one way to engage this. It's called bilateral stimulation and engage these two sides of your brain at once. And what it really did for me was it put distance between me and the, the trauma. When I think back to the trauma, traumatic event, there was a time when I felt a lot of big emotion around that. And then after the EMDR, now when I think back on the traumatic event, I think of it almost more in a factual way. Like it doesn't mean that there's no feeling there anymore, but it's like there's some distance between me and it, and it feels much, much better. Did you want to add anything? Anyone? No, that's good. I hope I did a good job. No, no, that was good. Oh, you did great. No, that's great. <laughs> yeah. I, I just wanted to say one thing about lonely people who've lost their spouses, sometimes people will mask. And they'll say, no, I'm okay, I'm hanging in there, I'm hanging in there. I always encourage people in their communities, reach out, keep reaching out, invite them over for dinner, see if they want to go for a walk, pick something up at the store for them, you know, that, because people can spiral and hide it. Uh, and sometimes it was, well, you need to talk to a therapist. Yeah, that can help. But talking to each other, I think, you all are the front line of preserving your peers and neighbors' mental health to the degree that you interact with them, that you knit community. Um, and if somebody's coming here and then they don't come, somebody call them up. Hey, how you doing? Didn't see you the other day. You know, that is super important. And I think communities where people are knit together are healthier communities. And you know, I've been a mental health professional for a long time, and I keep going back to this, let's build strong ecological communities where people have lots of support and resources in their community. We're more secondary and tertiary, not primary. So I just want to put that out there. You have a lot of power to help other people. You know, uh, one person can change a life and save a life. Just one acquaintance, uh, somebody close. And I, I love it, uh, Haley has a men's group here um, where the men have a breakfast. And uh, I think it's great for them to share in their experiences and all. It helps with loneliness, really, yep. big time. Um, just to piggyback on the EMDR conversation, there are a number of providers in Western Mass who specialize in EMDR, so if it is something you are interested in, it is available. Um, and to add to the comment um, regarding loss of spouse and, and the difficult transition that follows, uh, the group that I have been facilitating in East Hampton, the focus has been uh, bereavement support, and I can't tell you how nice it has been to see people of, of different ages who have lost their spouses connect and someone will start to tell a story and the person next to them will say, oh my God, I can't believe somebody else gets this. I, that is exactly the same for me. And so it's this very nice shared connection and some are older seniors and some are younger seniors. And so um, I know someone had asked about, you know, services around insurance and things like that, but um, sometimes a, a group and a shared common experience makes all the difference in the world. So if you know somebody or, or for yourself, um, there's a lot of groups available online, there are a lot of groups available slowly getting back um, in person in the community, but I think it makes a lot of difference for people. So hopefully that's helpful. Can I add something? Sure. Yeah, another angle on this. Um, my friend's dad is 99.9. <laughs> My friend lives in Oregon, so I go and visit my friend's dad most locally. And one of the things I've been impressed with this man is that he is a storyteller. And he loves to tell me stories about his past, the family past, his work. And I thought so what about the idea about writing groups? And I don't know if you have one here or if people get engaged in where people have an opportunity to write their stories write memoirs. Many people have 
for really interesting stories that nobody knows about. And it gives people an opportunity to get that sense of integrity that Eric Erickson was talking about. It's very non-pathological, it's not a mental health issue. It just, I have been, I have an experience to share, and I want to share it with other people. Um, I, I recently, with my friend's dad, wrote a very brief essay about going to school. So he was born in 1923. So he talked about going to school in the 1930s in New York. It's fascinating. You know, I just loved reading his stories. And we talked about that. And he talks about his dad, who was a doctor, and how he did, you know, he had a little portable x-ray machine, and all the things that his dad did. So I, I want to encourage that. I think it's a great way to just stay connected with people, to express a lot of important emotions and feelings and thoughts, and get affirmed. Well, I write, and I'm writing a book called Newton Times Square. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with being nude. <laughs> but I've been working on it for quite a while, and uh, I've written a lot of poems, and I write fun stuff. Something which is published in the LIR. People familiar with LIR? Here locally, learning and retirement? Mm -hmm. yes. And they published one called, did you say, the chic or cheap? It's about the hearing impaired and what people go through in a humorous a humor, like men exposing your lip line, you know, your beard. You, know, you have to read their charming line. <laughs> Just to have fun stuff, but I do a lot of writing. And um, when I was in the state hospital, uh, all I did was write poetry because the people were so sick and I couldn't identify with them. Not that I was sick, but I was sick in a different way. And uh, I wrote several poems, and the one I, I, I'm going to share with you right now, it, it tells it all. It says, the trees are black and the forest gray, with ashy casts and foggy rays. Can't the sunlight come through the air and give some hope to the spirit there? Then may we see the beauty that exists, consign a moment, and enjoy this long-awaited bliss. Well, like what do you have me do? when every day you force myself to talk to you. I'm tired of life and death combined. Tell me what is really mine. Do I have the sunlight coming through the fog? Or will darkness always prevail, casting shadows from my grave and longing for my fall? Let me yield to the sweetness and the joy of a forest shiny green and gold, with amber sounds coming through the leaves, yearning for my touch. Hear me, life, extend your hand and guide me through until we find that tender patch of precious blue. Writing helps. Does anybody have any more questions to address our group? Um, we've been at this for a very enriching hour, and really thank you for your participation and your earnest attention. And I want to thank again the panelists for, you know, months long correspondence with me and um, doing what it takes to organize this. Really, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here. And um, I've learned a lot from the different facets of the field that you represent. Thank you. Um, so I just want to invite you all to mingle informally if you haven't had any snacks. You see, we have many. Um, help yourselves. And I will be thinking a lot about some of the really good suggestions that are things that I can follow up on here at the Senior Center. So thank you. Thank you.